This week on the 302, we hitch a ride with the Wilmington and Western Railroad for an inside look at this iconic treasure. Hop on board, the 302 is headed down the track. Hey there, 302, it's Jackie Ferris. We are at the Wilmington and Western Railroad Yards getting a behind the scenes at this iconic treasure. Joining me now is David Ludlow. He is the Special Projects Director for the railroad. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for coming and seeing us, Jackie. Thank you. Now, I know in 2020, we're celebrating 148 years of this line, but 54 years of the nonprofit educational function that you guys serve here. Tell me a little bit about the uh, Wilmington and Western Railroad. Okay, the rail line was built uh, in 1872 and um, it was to serve the mills and passenger service and the uh, dairies and things like this to the western part of the county. It went to Landenburg, Pennsylvania. It has been in continuous operation since 1872. But our organization, the nonprofit Wilmington and Western Railroad, which is owned by Historic Red Clay Valley Incorporated, began their operations in 1966. So in 1966, a group of individuals got together, formed the nonprofit to protect the railroad from abandonment and disuse. Uh, just back in 2016, we celebrated 50 years of operating this railroad. And as a little side note, we were the seventh tourist railroad formed in the United States of America. And you're also one of the largest attractions for Delaware, is that right? Yes, we are Delaware's operating railroad museum. We still maintain and operate over 10 miles of track. We go to the town of Hokessen, Delaware, which is about where the Ark of Delaware is, right to the edge, and then our track is, uh, is terminated there. We still run trains to Hokessen, but the majority of our trains go to the area of Mount Cuba. So we're talking about uh, 10, almost 11 miles of track that you guys service? That's correct. We do have 10 miles of track. We do um, autumn leaf trains because the time of the year is beautiful. We go up through the valley, through some beautiful estate land, and so we, we'll go to Hokessen. And a lot of times on the weekends, we will operate this steam locomotive for our autumn leaf trains. So tell us a little bit about what we've got here, this uh, beautiful train here. Tell me all about it. This is, this is, we have two of these, uh, two locomotives. This is the 58, and we also, inside the building to our left, we have the 98. This iconic steam engine um, is what is called an 060 switcher. It has six driving wheels, but no uh, leading wheels and no trailing wheels. So it's an 060. It was built in 1907 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia. It takes approximately six hours to boil the water in it. So on a Saturday morning when we're having autumn leaf trains, the crews will come down, they will pull the locomotives out, they will fire the engine up, build up the pressure very slowly, and then we're ready to go, hook up to the train set, and go to Green Bank Station. Now, all the folks that have to come in super early, those are volunteers, right? Oh yes, the, the entire rail line is operated by volunteers. The track inspectors, the uh, track workers, the conductors, the engineers, the brakemen that are putting the train together as we speak, they're all volunteers. So when somebody comes, this isn't the only train that they're gonna see. You have a whole, I don't wanna say a stable, because I'm sure that there's a better term for it, but you have a, a several um, trains that you feature or pieces of equipment that you operate, right? Oh yes, we do. We have, we have two operable steam locomotives. We have two operable diesel locomotives. And we also have what's called a doodle bug a 1929 Pennsylvania rail car called the Paul Revere. Why do they call it a doodle bug? Um, there's a lot of speculation as to why it's called a doodle bug, but it can go forwards and backwards with the same uh, efficiency. The engineer drives it one direction, he comes to the other end, and he drives it the other direction. So the train can go back and forth, and I believe 
The name Doodlebug just kind of caught on with passengers of the day in the 20s. And said, so it's a Doodlebug. It goes forwards, it goes backwards. It's kind of a Doodlebug. So what must it take to keep uh, this historic equipment up and running? I mean, you talked about the volunteers, but it must take a lot of uh, experts in the field. It does. It absolutely does. The gentleman that maintains the steam locomotives has been with us since, well, forever. Uh, his name is Steve Jensen, and Steve maintains the, Steve, the steam locomotives, the diesel locomotives. There are a, cr a group of people that maintain the tracks. There are a group of people that inspect all of these also. And then we have the coaches. The coaches require constant maintenance also. So um, it's a constant ongoing. We are not supported by the state. We are a private, nonprofit organization. And the way we maintain the, uh, the equipment, the rolling stock, and the tracks is all through ticket sales. So this must be a, a train lover's dream to come and, and actually uh, ride one of these trains and see the trains up close. Talk to me about the enthusiasts and the first timers that come. Yeah, um, and that is, that is why our volunteer base works so well. There's a, there's a whole group or subset of, of society that are very much into pres preserving history and operating trains and, and the nostalgia that goes along with that. So a lot of our volunteers are, are very interested in, in working and they come down, they'll fill out the application, they begin their volunteer process with an orientation, and we put them on the train pretty quickly and start training them. That's amazing. Yes. So David, we're gonna go now and look at how the whole thing is put together, is that right? Yeah, what they are doing right now, we are building what is called a consist for the day. The train consists of, so it's the train consist. They are now putting together the coaches on the various service tracks and yard tracks that are behind us. We can go see how they actually do this, uh, and you can see how the conductor is giving uh, you know, signals to the engineer to hook the cars together, run a test of the braking system, and then get everything ready to go. And then they will go over to Green Bank Station and pick up our uh, passengers who are over there buying tickets right now. All righty, so we're going to see that straight ahead. Hi, I'm Tina Betts, and not is 302 just an area code for the city of Wilmington. 302 is a show that you can watch and that I'm watching. Welcome back. We are taking a behind the scenes look at the Wilmington and Western Railroad. I'm here with David. He is going to tell us a little bit about exactly how they put the train together. David, so what are we seeing? I know we've got the train coming down the track now. What's happening? Well, the, the train, uh, dependent on our pre-sold tickets and what we expect for the day at the ticket window, we will then build a train set. It's called a consist. And we will put the consist together here in the rail yard. And that is what's happening right now as we speak. The trains are hooked together. And then the air hoses, which operate the braking system, will all be connected. And that's what's happening right here. So this is kind of like a delicate uh, dance of sorts. I mean, you're on tracks and everything, but this is very heavy equipment that you have to move around and connect and go from one track to another. How does that work, actually? Oh, absolutely. This is, uh, it, one, it's a very dangerous place. Everyone has to know what the other person is doing. There's a lot of radio communications and also hand signals. Um, a lot of times the conductor will go over with the engineer what we're going to put together for that consist for the day, depending on the number of seats that we need and which pieces of equipment in order we want to put them in. And then they will build the train set. So there is a series of yard tracks in here that allow us to put trains in different locations and in different um, orientations such that we can couple them together, hook the air hoses up. And then we, are, we will do the brake test and then we will go to the station to pick up the passengers. So about how long does it take to connect all of the uh, passenger cars together? There are, there are some train sets. There are some that may take um, an hour and a half depending on the order we have. We have uh, the open car is on today. We have our regular passenger coaches and we have the caboose rental where a uh, family's going to probably have a birthday party in there. Sometimes we have three caboose rentals, we have the open car, and we have a parlor car and the full train set of four coaches. That takes a while to build it. So you have a, a lot of combinations of what the train could actually pull, right? What the engine could pull. That is correct. That is correct. 
So what do we have today? What are we looking at today? All right, these are, these are Delaware Lackawanna coaches that we have um, uh, operated for our entire, just about our entire history. Um, we have uh, four of them in our fleet and we also have the open car, which is right behind us. Because it's an autumn leaf train, we're putting that one in. And I do know that there is a caboose rental, probably for a child's birthday party, so that's why the caboose is gonna be on. Regardless, the caboose would always be on the train set because we back up. We cannot turn the train around at the other end. It's a common question. People say, well, how do you turn it around and drive it home? Yeah. We don't. You back it up, back down the tracks. And our staff and our conductors and brakemen are on the lead end caboose to get it back home to Green Bank Station. And the locomotive is pushing in reverse. So it's a team effort. You've got folks in the front and folks in the back that kind of make sure that everything is, is always. Uh, operating. Always, absolutely always. We have also passenger attendants and trainmen on board in case there happens to be a problem with a, you know, a, a, an individual that needs to stop for some reason or something like that. Um, so there are trainmen in the coaches brakeman and conductor, engineers and brakemen up in the locomotive. So about how fast uh, does the train go? We will probably operate today at a speed of uh, 10 miles per hour. We are able and certified to be able to be 15 miles an hour. Um, but depending on, on the distance that we would be going, and today we'll be going about five miles, we will be averaging 10 miles per hour. And it'll take a half an hour to get out there we will lay over at our picnic grove for a half an hour and then a half an hour back home. So we're taking a look at all of these beautiful train cars. Is this something that uh, you guys have had for a long time? I mean, where do you get the passenger cars and the trains and things that provide this service? Well, many, many years ago when a lot of these cars were being dismantled and, and taken to the scrapyards because they were no longer usable or had no more life left in them for the railroad that was operating them. They became, I don't know, discarded or abandoned and, and many of the tourist railroads began to purchase these people who were preservationists, began to collect them and purchase them. So there is, a, there is an industry or a small network of people in the tourist railroad business who have different coaches dating from different times of the year and the centuries they can put together a, a, a sales list and maybe we'd go and look at some of the coaches and decide if that was something we needed to put in our, our fleet. Now as far as acquiring coaches and taking care of the coaches, um, you rely on donations but you also have a grant or got a grant? We do, we do. We have a, um, the state of Delaware does uh, assist us with some of our track maintenance and they, um, they also assist us, the legislature every year gives us something called grant and aid and that comes out of Dover. And we use that to uh, restore the coaches, help pay for some of the paid staff, and also um, you know, keep them looking nice and uh, you know, preserved in the fashion that they should be. So we've talked about the coaches. We talk about how you guys put the coaches and the, the, uh, the engines together. But now we're actually going to get on and take a ride. So stay with us. Hi, I'm Debbie, and I love the 302. Welcome back now, David. We are now on the train. So tell me, what are we going to see? Well, the train is, is following the Red Clay Creek up through the uh, northern part of Newcastle County. And this is the original line that was built. And we will be going past different kinds of things in the, in the, in the topography and in the geography of the area. There's an old spring water company that used to carry uh, spring water bottles back into Wilmington. That's off on our right hand side of our train. And just coming up a little bit shortly, there, so there was an old amusement park called yeah. the Brandywine Springs Amusement Park. It's really uh, scenic. Now, the tour, the train tour that we're on now is the fall leaves, but you have a lot of uh, different events throughout the year, right? Yes, we do. We have, we have, we have special events all year long. Um, they actually kick off, let's say, in, in the beginning of a season. We launch the season uh, for Valentine's Day, and we will run at least two, sometimes three, Valentine's dinner, uh, dinner trains 
around February 14th. Really? So what 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 happens for a Valentine's dinner train? The coaches we're sitting on are converted over and have tables on them. The whole train is heated by a supplemental heat system. There will be a buffet in the center of the train and each of the people will go up to the buffet and get their dinner and then come back to the coaches as we travel up the line, sometimes in the snow, sometimes uh, just in the darkness because it's February and we're going out at night. So after Valentine's Day, you have East, you have Mother's Day and Easter. We, we have Easter, Easter Bunny Express for the children. Then we have Mother's Day brunch trains. And then we, we get into the summer trains, which are, you know, June, July, August. And then the ridership is a little bit slower at that time. But we may have um, princess trains. We have princess uh, trains for children, that, uh, where the princesses all show up at the station and sing with the children in their costumes. Really? Every, all the children come in costumes. We also have superheroes, where the superheroes will be on the train. Those are in the summer months. And then we get into the autumn leaf trains, which we're riding right now. Mm -hmm. And then we begin Santa Claus and holiday lights. Exactly. Everybody loves getting on the train for Santa Claus, right? That's right. That's right. The trains are fully decorated. Um, we have Santa Claus that is, well, he's a real Santa. That's all I can say. He's a real Santa. He's not a costume Santa. He's a real Santa. And he walks through all the trains, sits with all the children, gets their... Uh, you know, there are lists of things that they'd like to see, poses for pictures, and passes out chocolate, uh, Santa Claus pops to everybody. That's excellent. So on all of the routes, you have someone that gives you a little piece of history. We have a gentleman in the background that's telling the people on the train now exactly what's happening, right? That is right. They, 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 the passengers that we have today, many of them on uh, the midweek autumn leaves, are um, local outings from senior centers or groups or clubs that get together. And so we have uh, a narration on the train that talks about the, the uh, history of the valley, the noteworthy sites, and some of the ruins you'll see out the windows. And that's what he's doing right now. Tell me about the, uh, the art show. The art show is in February. Every year, the last weekend of February, we have our biggest fundraiser at the Memorial Hall the fire company in Hokesson. It's a three-day event starting on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. And 30% of all the art sales comes back to the railroad for our uh, major fundraiser of the year. While the art show is going on inside, we are running our doodle bug outside. So a lot of people will come just to ride the doodle bug. It's a $5 ticket. It has been forever. You can take a nice train ride at the end of February on the Doodle Bug at the Hokessa Memorial Hall last weekend of February. So I guess it's an opportunity for people to uh, to give back and help you guys with your mission to educate and preserve. That is you know. correct. So yep. if someone wanted to donate, what do they got to do? And are there special ways they can do it? Well, we um, you can donate to the organization online. You can um, send unrestricted donations with a, uh, a note and a letter, and we will acknowledge that. We are 501c3, um, so your, your donation is tax, uh, tax deductible. Um, we also, we have an annual giving, and anyone who is a member, we, we seek their support at the end of the year to help us with our mission. Um, we're, we're here to, to educate, entertain, preserve, and interpret history, and that's what we're trying to do. So any support that is that is uh, gained from the art show or from our annual giving goes right back into programming and keeping the trains running. We also have a, a couple of other things that we do. We have a history talk that is in the winter months, usually January, February, and March. There is a history talk where we will get together and bring in a historian of a certain area or an expert in a certain area of the valley, and we will have them talk to us. Um, and give us, uh, you know, the community a chance to see what was going on at this factory or this mill or this industry that was in the area. In the summer, we have Children's Summer Camp Day. So children 8 to 12 years old can come down and spend the most intensive day with yours truly and some of our other staff learning everything there is about a railroad. And they get to run some of the machines while we uh, show them how to maintain track how to run locomotives and how to main, uh, you know, weld and, and grind metal and things like this. Well, real quickly, talk to me about the need for volunteers. 
The Wilmington and Western has always done this with an all-volunteer operating staff. There are paid staff in the business office and the administration end of it. But everybody on the train today is volunteer. We will do this again on Saturday and we will do it again on Sunday with volunteers. There are currently maybe about 80 or 75 volunteers on the roster, but the, the core of the work is done by a smaller group of people who are here all the time. And some of them may move on. Life changes in one way or another. Maybe they've moved out of the thing, their job changes. So we're always having to put more people into the training because it takes a long time to train someone. So is that something where they would call you guys or go on the website? They can certainly call us. They could, uh, yeah, they could do it through a, uh, uh, you know, an online form on the website and write us an email and said, I'm interested in volunteering. We then would contact them back and set them up for a time to come in for an orientation to start to learn and see what it's like. We put them on the train almost immediately and they can start being a passenger attendant, usually within a week or two. Sounds exciting. David, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very nice. Education and everything. We'll be right back. on the Wilmington and Western Railroad, be sure to visit www.rr.com. That'll do it for this episode. We're going to leave you now with some beautiful fall foliage shots from inside the train. Until next time, we'll see you on the 302.